And now, Film Theory presents a dramatic reading of the comments from our last Godzilla vs. Kong theory. <clears throat> monkey, monkey, rar, rar, rar. Monkey, monkey, rar, rar. Monkey, monkey. This has been a dramatic reading of the comments. Good evening. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that bows to no one, but will do an extremely grateful curtsy if you remember to make like a titan and smash that subscribe button. And hey, would you look at that? Ring the bell, ladies and gentlemen! We got one right! We got one really right! Our prediction theory for Godzilla vs. Kong crushed it, like predicting every beat of the movie right on the money. How's that old saying go? Even a blind squirrel finds a nut? Well, I am buried in nuts, baby! Uh oh Phrasing. But you know what? I'm not done. I'm not gonna rest on my yannies or my laurels by just predicting the movie that we got. I want to go one step further. I want to predict the movie that we didn't get. I.e., I want to show you the version of Godzilla vs. Kong that we didn't and probably will never get to see. I'm coming for you, WB. Scrounging around to assemble the footage that you left behind on your cutting room floor. Today we're using everything from Hollywood gossip and production team interviews to narrative themes and odd dangling threads left behind in the final product to assemble the Godzilla vs. Kong movie that you never saw. The film that they didn't want you to see. Was it better? Was it worse? Well, stay tuned and let me know down in the comments below if you think that they made the right decision. So where is this theory actually coming from? Well, while watching Godzilla vs. Kong, more than a few people, myself included, noticed that it sometimes felt like this thing was shipped with a few parts missing. Oh sure, we have our essential story beats of lizard monkey fight, humans running away, lizard and monkey team up against evil robot, but between it all, there were plenty of lingering questions. Questions like, why aren't we following up on most of the unresolved plot threads from the previous movie? And where did the bad guys from the previous movies go? Also this guy. I mean, everything about this guy. Now sure, every movie shoots a lot more footage than it uses and has scenes that don't make the final cut. That's been the case like forever. But when Godzilla vs. Kong director Adam Wingard says that there's enough extra footage to do a five hour version, yeah, I'm gonna sit up and take notice. After all, they were already in pre production for Godzilla vs. Kong before they knew that the bigger, darker prequel King of the Monsters was a bit of a dud in terms of ticket sales. All of this and more begs the question, what was this movie before all the studio notes, production pauses, and pandemic delays? Now, to be fair, there is technically a bit of actual plot in this thing. Godzilla has gone all city attacky again, and this big tech company called Apex says they've figured out a special weapon that can stop him, but they need a power source to do it. That power source is hidden somewhere in the Earth's hollow core. To retrieve it, they need Kong to lead the way because of, um, because of, uh, g genetic memory and sam something about salmon spawning. Uh, shut up, it's a Godzilla movie. On Kong's team is a little girl named Gia who can talk to Kong with sign language. Meanwhile, Eleven from Stranger Things returns as her Godzilla whisperer character named Madison. Apparently, she's the only person who has ever watched a movie before ever because she can tell that the big, obviously evil company is actually evil, causing Godzilla's destructive behavior with their anti-Titan weapon, the creatively named named Mechagodzilla. Mechagodzilla, in true Neon Genesis Evangelion form, uses a neural interface to bridge a human pilot with the uplinked mind of the defeated alien King Ghidorah from the previous movie. This obviously goes awry when Ghidorah's consciousness wakes up and takes over the giant robot. As predicted, Kong and Godzilla have to team up to bring him down, and in the end, everyone gets their happily ever after, except for Hong Kong, which lays utterly decimated in the battle. So the first thing that should jump out to you while listening to the short plot summary is that both Titans get their own cheering section. Team Kong's Gia is a Skull Island native who communicates with her Titan via a crudely fashioned doll in sign language. Compare that to Team Godzilla's Madison, who used technology throughout both of her movies to reach the giant lizard. One mission is funded with high-end super science military tech, the other is running out of a sketchy van driven by a conspiracy podcaster. They are clearly set up to be opposite polarities, which is why it's weird when it gets to the ending and you realize that this is the first time the two teams have ever met or even known of each other's existence. Existence. What was the narrative point in making them so noticeably similar just for them to never interact? Well, that's where our mystery character comes in. See this guy? The creepy Apex henchman, chief technology officer who's always following the main villain around with a silent, I'm obviously more important than my not talking would indicate stare. Well, in the movie, as it stands, he turns out to be Mechagodzilla's pilot, until the ghost of King Ghidorah immediately electrocutes his brain and takes full control. Kind of a pointless role, right? Wrong. He's actually 
actually meant to be the son of Dr. Sirizawa, the heroic scientist from the first two Godzilla movies. Let them fight. Now, don't feel bad if you didn't catch this one. They only say his last name like once the first time he's introduced, and his connection back to one of, if not the most important human character from the previous films, goes completely unmentioned. Not in dialogue, not in reference, nothing. It's also clear that this was never meant to be a surprise reveal, considering in pre-movie interview footage, his character's full name is just laid out there on the table. So in this one character, we have ourselves the son of the guy who was obsessed with Godzilla and even died to bring the big lizard back to life in the previous movie. And now, this son of his is not only working with the guys who want to destroy Godzilla, he has literally volunteered himself to become the brain of the weapon designed to kill it. I mean, there has got to be some kind of revenge or daddy issue stuff that's been left on the cutting room floor here. You don't have to be a Hollywood screenwriter to see the whole, Dad, you missed my recital to go look for Godzilla again? Let me hop into my Megazord and take out my childhood frustrations arc totally taken shape with this character. Especially when you consider that the other main minion in this film is the corporate villain's daughter. Real daughter and his surrogate son. Whole thing is like a family affair on the villain's side. But more relevantly, if that had actually been Ren Shirazawa's character arc in the film, it would have made him and Mechagodzilla fit neatly into the mirroring dynamic that the other two titans have with their support teams. It also works thematically. All three of these characters are dealing with loss by relating to their titans in their own unique ways. Gia lost both her family and island, only to find comfort with her titan. Madison's mother was one of the bad guys, and her father is well-meaning but aloof, just like the sometimes good, sometimes bad, but always elusive Godzilla. And just like Ren seeking revenge on the dino that stole his father, Mechagodzilla, or rather Ghidorah's severed head, is angry and craves revenge against the Thunder Lizard. This would also make sense with some of the casting around the movie. Back in 2017, Chinese actress Zhang Ji was cast into the MonsterVerse, but her actual role was kept somewhat mysterious until the release of King of the Monsters, where it was revealed that she was actually playing two separate characters, twin sister scientists working with the Titan-studying organization Monarch. This was a winking nod back to the original mythology of these monsters, where a set of twin infant island priestesses were traditionally associated with the Mothra mythology. And while she was supposed to be appearing in the new Godzilla vs. Kong, none of her scenes made the final cut. Now, considering that she was on Dr. Sirizawa's exploration team in the earlier movie and was there when he died, the only character it would make sense for her to connect with would be Ren, possibly explaining his decision to join Apex in order to avenge his father. So, is that it? A few extra scenes fleshing out the backstory to one of the random humans, all cut for time because, let's be honest, no one cares about the human storylines in these things. I'm sorry about your brother. You know, Gia's parents were killed on the island. It was a gift from my Sarah. Nobody cares! I think the cut content around Ren Sirizawa was also setting up where the franchise would head to next. Remember, this movie was already well into pre-production when King of the Monsters underperformed. As such, it's likely that some of the cut materials were meant to set up where the MonsterVerse would head next after the big title bout. And the answer all lies here. I mean, let's be honest here. One of the clunkier, more awkward parts of this movie is how both Ren Sirizawa and Ghidorah's head are both needed to activate Mechagodzilla. I mean, in the final movie, it basically goes like this. They hardwired its DNA. Self-generating neural pathways capable of intuitive learning. It had three heads. Its necks were so long that communicated telepathically. If there's one here, another one inside of that, that thing. All right, since this was a bunch of scientific gobbledygook, let me try. They needed the psychic powers of Ghidorah's skull to filter through a human brain in order to pilot a giant mech for reasons. It is long, it is awkward, and if you pay attention to how many lines about this thing get said in ADR, it's probably not what the original intention was. For those who don't know, the letters ADR in filmmaking stand for Automated Dialogue Replacement. It's the process of re-recording dialogue after filming to improve the quality or make changes to the original script. Now, you can usually tell bad or rushed ADR dialogue in one of two ways. Either the audio quality shifts slightly, Donya Madani, poor woman has tuberculosis, or the dialogue doesn't perfectly match the character's lips. Yes, yes, your opinion. Since matching the audio up completely to the original scene is incredibly difficult and time consuming, many movies cover up ADR by not showing the actor while they're speaking on camera. A recent high profile example of this is with the Disney Plus series Falcon and the Winter Soldier, where an entire central plotline about a global disease had to be cut because of the current world situation, and as a result, most lines about the actual plot of the series are said off camera. I want the serum back, or 
I will find you. Notice how the mentions of the serum happen without anyone on screen? It implies that those lines had to be recorded later and merged in whatever footage that had already been shot. Let's watch the lip sync, okay? Now, how does this apply to Godzilla vs. Kong? Well, notice how any and all lines about Ghidorah's skull or the upgrade are spoken with Ren off camera. And pay attention to the audio quality, which has slightly more reverb and hollowness to it when he's the one speaking. We have no idea how this energy source will affect the mecha. Get in the goddamn chair. It implies that there is more to the plot than the skull only serving as an energy source. My guess was that Ghidorah was eventually meant to possess Ren Shirazawa. And if you think that sounds insane, remember that the final plot of this thing that they expect us to roll with is that the dead space dragon demonically possessed a robot via Wi-Fi, so really not that much further of a stretch. Here's the thing, this one small change of Ghidorah possessing Ren, one, makes everything a little bit clearer, two, gives a reason for a pilot having to be inside the suit, three, makes sense considering they already talk a lot about Ghidorah's psychic powers, and four, it sets up a villain for the future movies. That's right, after you've already done the big battle royale with all the famous monsters, and then the big monkey lizard fight, there's nowhere else to go except Mecha Ghidorah. Yeah, that is a thing. At one point better known from imported Godzilla toys than from films, Mecha Ghidorah was a cyborg introduced in 1991's Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. Like a lot of the second wave or Heisei era Godzilla films, its broader plot was a kaiju stuffed riff on popular international blockbusters of the era. In this case, the movie they were riffing on, believe it or not, was the Terminator series. I'll be back. No joke, in the main story, time travelers from the future come to Godzilla-ravaged present-day Japan offering to help. They do this by going even further back in time to the 40s to prevent Godzilla's mutation, but wait, there's a twist. These time travelers are actually a multinational coalition of villains whose real agenda is to prevent Japan from becoming a world economic superpower. They do this by leaving adorably merchandisable baby Ghidorahs to get mutated. One thing leads to another, and eventually the good guys turn the remains of the defeated Ghidorah into a human-piloted cyborg. Adding to the weirdness, it was also supposed to be a King Kong movie. Yeah, the plan was to do a huge Godzilla event movie, specifically timed to the 30th anniversary of King Kong vs. Godzilla. And since Toho figured correctly that Universal and the other rights holders to Kong would never let them use the character for a reasonable price, they set the storyline up with all the time travel and robotics to justify using Mecha Kong. But when their lawyers figured that, yeah, the Americans will probably find a way to make that not okay, Toho decided that Ghidorah a robot would be a solid runner-up. So my guess is that the death of Ren Shirazawa in the pilot seat of the mech was actually meant to be a possession in the pilot seat of the mech. Meant to keep the ongoing monster villain of the series alive, waiting to strike again. But when the future of the monsterverse became unclear, all references to weirdly supernatural stuff like that had to get cut, including any end credit scenes alluding to Ren still being alive and under the control of the giant space dragon. And there you have it, theorists. The secret plot to Godzilla vs. Versus Kong that you'll never see. Ren Shirazawa, looking to get revenge on the lizard that killed his father, joins forces with Apex to control the monstrosity known as Mechagodzilla. When Ghidorah is too much for the suit to handle, he gets possessed, which opens the door to more mechanized dragon madness in future installments. Would it have added much to the final movie? Probably not. No one watches these things for the humans. But would it have made the final product we got a bit more cohesive? Yeah, probably. And also, because of those cuts, this movie felt like a definitive end for the characters. No end credit it seen, no nothing. And yet, it was very clearly a hit in the box office, meaning that they're gonna want to make more. So the long story short, friends, don't be surprised if the next film's trailer opens with a peek inside the wreckage of Mechagodzilla only to have Ren's eyes pop open. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And it's springtime over here at Theorist HQ, and you know what that means. What's that? Leave my house to marvel in the beauty and fertility brought forth by the vernal equinox? Ha <laughs> ha! You must be new here. Though, now that you mention it, I have been trying to make more of an effort to go out- Ugh, sorry, give me a second. To go out- <sighs> Sorry. To go outside. Ooh, ooh. And given that it's springtime and today's video is sponsored by our good friends at Bright Cellars, I am officially declaring it the start of white wine season. That's right, baby. No more living in fear of being chided for drinking a Riesling in January. And if you have no idea of what I just said, keep listening because I think Bright Cellars might be perfect for you. Bright Cellars is the monthly wine subscription that uses a seven question quiz to match you to wines based on your tastes. The quiz is powered by an algorithm that analyzes your taste profile 
profile to suggest wines that you'd be guaranteed to like. They make it fast and easy to try wines that are sourced from all over the world. I don't know about you, but before I started my wine education with Bright Cellars, I got super intimidated in the wine section at the grocery store. I mean, there are just so many options, and there's only so much you can tell about a wine from just the label on the bottle. But with Bright Cellars, every bottle comes with these handy cards explaining the wine's origins, flavor notes, pairing suggestions, and more. Over the months of me using Bright Cellars, they've given me the vocabulary and knowledge I needed to feel competent when it comes to all things wine. Plus, I can actually go to my Bright Cellars account and rate the wines I receive on a scale of 1 to 5, so that the next round is even better suited to my tastes. So not only am I learning about wine in general, I'm actually learning about the particular profiles, notes, and flavors that I specifically like. For instance, who knew that buttered popcorn would be a flavor that I look for in my wines? Bright Cellars did. That's who. Bright Cellars has given the theorist community an exclusive 50% off their first six bottle box, plus a bonus bottle if you use the link down in the description right below this video. So take the quiz and get started on your wine education today. That's 50% off your first six bottle box, plus a bonus bottle by using the link down in the description below. And I'll see you all next week.